Welcome to the Love and Lattes podcast, a coffee lover's guide to good vibes, books, rom-coms, and everything in between. Now grab some coffee and let's get chatting. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Tanabe. I am the author of The Sunset Crowd, Out July 4th, and you are listening to the Love and Lattes podcast. Thank you so much for chatting with me. I really, really appreciate it. You're a best-selling author. You've had some really huge books that have reached really high level of success. So congratulations. I'm sure the Sunset Crowd will be no different. I, I hope so. Thanks so much. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of very good books out there. So anyone who takes the time to read mine, I'm very appreciative. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a big time. I feel like in the literary industry, there's just so many books being made. So if yours can stand out, that means you're doing something right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's changed a lot since I started publishing books in 2013. So for the better, I'd say. Yes. It's kind of, I guess, maybe more accessible too for um, people with things like um, Wattpad, I guess I've heard things come from that. So you just never know. Um, so it's, I guess it's nice for newcomers, but then it's interesting for someone like you, you've been in an industry for a while just to like watch this evolution of things. Yeah. I think, I think there's, um, you know, there's of course always traditional publishing and then there are places like Wattpad or self-publishing on Amazon or, you know, I mean, people who knows what's going to happen now with AI, it's kind of scary, but there's there seems to be a lot of love for the written word right now and and I love it so nice kind of go back to traditional form of entertainment historical fiction a big part of like what you write but it's funny to think of the 1970s as being historical because it's not that long ago but it kind of is it's getting a ways back um do you want to talk about like why you chose that particular time period for the sunset crowd yeah, I mean, I I was born in the 80s, so the 70s aren't far behind from when I was born. So I feel like it was a comfortable era for me. It's also a really glamorous era. It was kind of a big part of the women's movement. And I just wanted to do something kind of glamorous and not that research intensive. The two books I wrote before the Sunset Crowd, well, maybe the four books, honestly, were so research heavy and it had been the pandemic. And I was I was pretty burned out. My book before it was A Woman of Intelligence. I went very like deep into my own personal emotions for that book. And I was like, I was ready for a party, honestly. And and who could party like the people who were young in the 70s? I mean, that's like a Studio 54 era. It was pretty wild. And I, I was just personally ready to write that kind of book. I listened to a couple other interviews that you did promoting Woman of Intelligence. My goodness, yeah, like it's a thriller, it's spies and Cold War. So this is like a total departure, which I'm sure is so nice for you to just kind of see where else your your mind can take these characters and um, what you can come up with. Yeah, I really enjoy it. I think there's a lot of pressure in publishing to do the same thing over and over again. Honestly, it's like if you write romance, Regency romance novels, like keep writing Regency romance novels. If you write modern day thrillers keep doing that. But I'm just a person who gets a little bored doing the same thing. So I I really kind of write for me first and foremost, because I have to get the book out. And then hopefully I'll have an audience that follows. So it does feel like more of a gamble than what some people do. But but I like it. And I, I trust that readers are into the writing more than, you know, wanting a formulaic book every time. That's so true. And kind of keep it fresh, not like not only like you're saying for the audience, but for yourself, just like as your creator at the heart of it all. So that must uh, just like keeping things new and seeing what else you can explore. I mean, we're getting a little ahead of things. I didn't even ask you. Can you tell everyone what the Sunset Crowd is about? I'm just like loving this novel that I've read so far. No, it's it's hard not to just like go into process. But yeah, so the Sunset Crowd takes place in 1977 in Los Angeles it's kind of a fake it till you make it story. It's about all these people in Hollywood trying to make it as producers, as writers, musicians, and it's sort of the slog of the arts, which is something that really interests me, but also about a look at America. And it's like, who gets to make it in America, no matter how hard you work, you know, sometimes doors are just closed to people and you have to find sneaky ways to get around those closed doors so you know it's definitely like a little great gatsby inspired 
a little, a little like just, yeah, seventies vibes inspired. And, and it was, it was really fun to write. I mean, it's a mood, honestly, this book, I was like, the seventies are going to explode at you. It's going to be like a glamor bomb. And I feel like, I feel like I accomplished at least that. Yeah. It's a very specific time period fashion wise, just like what was trending at the moment. It's funny how you go into target now. And I'm like, it feels like you're walking into like seventies fashion. It's, it's really full circle in a weird way. Absolutely. I I just bought a bunch of seventies clothes for this book tour. Um, And I did go like vintage shopping because it's fun, but I also just went to like, you know, stores in the mall and I found tons of stuff. So it does feel like fashion wise, I have hit the zeitgeist, but I think, you know, we had a tough couple of years and the seventies were kind of a very free, crazy fashion forward era. And I think people are feeling it, you know? Absolutely. I mean, feather your hair, get a daisy, put it behind your ear, go just all like chill and do the peace signs. <laughs> totally. It's it's fun. It's a good, it's a good departure, I think. But yeah, so one of the characters in my in my book actually owns sort of a lifestyle boutique, like a clothing, it's the store of, you know, the sunset strip. And so fashion became a big part of the book through that too. And also just, you know, with Hollywood, I mean, it's obviously looks are a very big part of it, you know, in a bad way, in a good way, you know? Yeah. I'm so curious to read this and like kind of through these characters, like how they're navigating, um, because they're not necessarily like all actors, they're like kind of behind the scenes as well. Um, screenwriters, producers, assistants, it's really cool. Yeah, I didn't want to make it just about like an actress. I There are a few there, but the writers really interest me. Yeah. The producers and, and the hustle, the hustle interests me, the longevity of people like, you know, talents, what 50%, that seems like a high percentage and the rest of it's kind of grit. And the grit is what fascinates me. I think it's a very American thing too. It's like, you know, anyone can make it in America if you work hard enough. And I sort of look at like, is that true or not? And then you even have like a character, I guess they're from Hawaii who, and they came to Los Angeles. Is that, did I get yeah, that? Yeah, I have a, my, my heartthrob is named Kai de la Fair and he's French Hawaiian, more Hawaiian than French. And he is a really good writer. He's a screenwriter, but his first film is about Hawaii and it does really well. And then everyone wants him to do like Hawaii again and again and again. And it sort of looks at the way people of color can get really pigeonholed into having to like keep producing the art that represents them. And he's like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to write about Paris. And they're like, well, no, we want you to just like hula dance around Los Angeles. So yeah, it kind of looks at, yeah, I'm always interested in writing men who I don't see very often in literature and making them super sexy and like fighting every stereotype around. But he himself, I have the character fighting these stereotypes in his craft. So that was really interesting for me to write. Flipping the script a little bit uh, because you think of women always being stereotyped, but you don't necessarily think about male characters. At least I I haven't really come across anything like that. So it's interesting you tackle that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I remember reading an article when like the show Homeland was really big and there was a guy that played one of the terrorists and he was talking about how many times he would played a terrorist in Hollywood. And he said, nobody can die better than I can. And I was like, you know, I bet that's true. But also I wish you could be like just a romantic comedy lead or something, you know, it really made me that interview made me think about the way you know, people who are not just like white, heterosexual, male, it's like navigate Hollywood. Yeah. Like you get typecast so much. Oh. Everyone does like, even, even like you were saying, like um, as an author, like they want you to write the specific type and style of book and don't go outside of it. It's amazing. It kind of just goes across all realms. Totally. It, it really does. I mean, I look at like the romance authors doing really well today, like Colleen Hoover. What if she was like, I'm going to write a violent world war ii novel you know people be like what (laughs) no you can't like it's why even like 
you know, some authors that have really made it will use a different name to write a different genre so that people don't like, so they don't shock their fans. So weird. Just the world and society's perceptions of you. But I was even going to say like society. It's just amazing to see like with a woman of intelligence being set in the early fifties. And then you have this in the late seventies. I mean, look how much society changed in like that time frame. It's not even that long and gosh, just like vast uh, differences. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, women were having way more fun in the 70s than they were in the 50s. <laughs> After having like plunged into the early 50s and then doing the late 70s, like, whoo, if you're going to pick an era, do not pick the 50s. It was it was a tough time for women. No, the 70s, like I talked to some women who were young in the 70s, young in their 20s, and they were like, look, honey, like there was birth control in the 70s. Like times were times were good. You know, the the AIDS crisis hadn't hit yet. I'm not saying America was perfect at all. There was lots of trouble, um, you know, in Los Angeles, especially, but like just looking at what women could do and the way they had economic freedom, sexual freedom. I mean, it was, it was a big change. The era of freedom. I mean, I know you do research. You've talked about this on other interviews and podcasts, but like, I mean, because this isn't that far in the past how much research did you do did you watch like any I was I instantly thought like almost famous um just from reading what this is about just kind of like that cool vibe and music industry and everything but what did you like read what did you watch yeah I think it's really important when you're doing historical fiction to or you know close to historical fiction to really watch the movies of the era because almost famous I love it but it's it's modern right so like it's almost our kind of disco ball take on what the 70s were were like. I mean, you watch movies from the actual 70s and like the tech is so bad, the picture is so bad. It's like, it's just, they're so in a way like almost unwatchable. But, you know, I read a book my agent recommended called Scruples by Judith Krantz. It's like a kind of romance novel about Hollywood and there is a store in it and it's the exact right year and it's LA and it's like smutty and fun and I loved it. It was a giant bestseller in the 70s and I kind of unless you're really following it you wouldn't know it now. I didn't know it. Oh my gosh, that book had the biggest influence on me. Yeah, so just I I do read a lot of the books that were published in the 70s and then watch movies yeah made in the 70s and then the clothes like I went really deep into like Halston and Yves Saint Laurent and just everything that was that was going on there because I think people think 70s and they think like it's a paisley nightmare and you have to remind them of how chic everything was you know this is like Bianca Jagger Lauren Hutton Rolling Stones it was it was hot it's fun to look at like I think there's even Instagram accounts you can go on like Pinterest just like the true 70s fashion it was really amazing and I mean the flare jeans and uh, high-waisted bell bottoms and all that it's it's uh it's interesting how it's kind of stayed in style all of these years I will tell you a high-waisted bell bottom there's like not a more flattering pant made I mean I just bought them today for my book tour and I was like I think I just lost 10 pounds by like putting on these pants I mean they're they're a beautiful thing you know I had to be a young person in the in the like noughties and it was a less forgiving decade yeah, that silhouette, you can't go wrong with that. I mean, and you're about to go on like this Los Angeles adventure for your book tour, which is so fun to kind of take it back to like where this book is set. Uh, are you so excited for that? I am. I am. I didn't mean to do it selfishly just so I could hang out in LA. I had just done New York um, with a woman of intelligence and I wanted to to try something else, but that was still a comfort zone for me, a city I knew decently well I'm I have tried to write in places that like I have never set foot and honestly I fail every time so yeah this was really fun to to kind of get to know Los Angeles in a different way I, I'd never spent so much time there and now I just I just love it I really I think there's just so much room for creativity in Los Angeles in a way that the New York is losing a little bit, unfortunately, just because of how priced out people are in that city. So yeah, I think there's a, a big literary movement in LA now. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. 
Yeah, there's there's no other city quite like it. It's very unique. Um, everyone should visit it at least once in their lives. Uh, just it's an experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This morning, I guess you put up a, a cool video kind of showing like different um, pages of your book and then showing the locations throughout Los Angeles. That was really neat to see that juxtaposition. Um, do you want to talk about like selecting these iconic spots? Yeah, I think when you're writing books in a city that people that is on screen all the time, right? Like LA, you see so much in movies, people know it, I wouldn't say as well as New York, but it's certainly a place people will like recognize things. And I think people want to recognize things. So I have a scene at the Hollywood sign that I really love to write. And my characters, um, one of them sings in the Troubadour and sort of that legendary music club where like Elton John made his U.S. debut in it. And there's places like um, at the time it was Chinese theater where you have uh, these big movie debuts. You know, these places that you've seen before that you, the name's going to ring a bell. Chateau Marmont, of course, is uh, the hotel where there have been some famous ODs, but also like a lot of you have Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan shenanigans. Um, and so I try to have a lot of that just because it's fun. I think people can kind of imagine it while also inventing some places that are mixed in. And if you do it well, you'll have people Googling. Like my goal is for people to be like, is this, is this real? Was this store sunset on sunset real? Cause it feels real and it feels like a place I'd want to go. So that was my goal. But I'm really bad at just like making things up from zero. I, I often need something. So even Sunset on Sunset, the store is not real, but I picked a building on the Sunset Strip, which is in that Instagram reel that I thought, oh, this is where I'd put the store. And I would drive down this street if I were going to this store. And so last time I was in LA, I, I took a lot of videos just to kind of show people where my brain was. Like you hear people put like a name to a face, you're putting like, a location to an idea and connecting those two. So you can always reference that. Yeah. And then I, of course, I had a 1977 paper map of Los Angeles on my floor the whole time, because let me tell you, if you get something wrong in a book, you will hear it. You will hear about it. And if I got any street wrong, even if, it, you know, something that exists today that didn't exist in the seventies, I was, I was scared of getting anything wrong so hopefully it's all right yeah there's sticklers out there they're like wait a second that is not how that street is oh, yeah. they'll be like no actually you would have you, you turned there and not taken a right like it's like to that <laughs> minutia wow that's so funny everyone's so detailed i guess you have to be as well if you're gonna get it right um and that's uh, where the important. research comes in handy <laughs> totally accuracy well i guess like of all these locations is there one that's maybe your favorite in the book that that but that was also your favorite to visit yeah i mean it's funny because i'm from the east coast and we walk for everywhere you know you're so used to walking everywhere i walked a ton in la and i would text my friends and be like i've walked 15,000 steps and they're like well that's not possible <laughs> Like, nobody walks unless you're like in the hills or you're purposely going on a hike. Like no one walks 15,000 steps in the city. And I was like, no, all I'm doing is just walking back and forth on like on sunset. Like this is so much of my book takes place on sunset. And it is sort of weird. You are kind of alone. Like there's not a lot of people walking down the sunset strip. But for me, I mean, that stretch of West Hollywood was really fun to write about because it, it has changed, you know, I mean, it's not like that's the epicenter of cool anymore in LA. That's, you know, it's maybe more like Silver Lake and Echo Park and all that. But at the time, there were all these clubs, there were these like music clubs. And I was like, this is where you would put the hottest store in the city. So it was really fun for me to walk down Sunset and kind of imagine the world as it was. And of course, like Chateau Marmont is still there. So walking up there and trying to act like I was spending $1,500 a night on a room when I definitely was not. <laughs> so I would like go for breakfast and buy like an egg and then kind of trespass for a few hours. I had a funny question I was going to ask you. I love the characters' names in this book. Um, How do you decide like what you're going to name these people? 
That's the second, you're the second person in like two days who has told me they like the characters' names. Yeah, yay, that's a good sign. I always try to find names that are like a little bit unique, but you're not uh, like, uh, I don't know, they're memorable, but they're not like, not like 15 unique names, you know, where you're going to need a sort of a, a family tree to keep up. But like Kai very specifically is Hawaiian French. So I give him more like a Hawaiian first name and a French last name. Even though this is maybe the most boring name in my book, it has the best backstory. My my sort of narrator of the book is named B. DuPont, B-E-A. But when I started to write this book, I had some sort of like bee's nest outside of my house and I was kind of into it. It was kind of like weirdly atmospheric instead of scary. I mean, they weren't stinging me or anything. And it influenced her name and it influenced the very first line of the book. The first line of the book is it was the winter of the dead bees. And I wrote the book in winter while surrounded by bees who were like dying around me. So it was kind of a, it's an example of just like life influencing your characters. They had a sample of the audiobook up and I heard that that was what they included in it. So I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It's the very, it's the very first thing. So funny how it like connects to her name. I love that. It's just, I'm just so curious about your, your thought process. Well, um, can you tell everyone where they can purchase this and where they can follow you online? Yeah. So obviously support your local indie if you are able to. Bookshop is a great place to buy or, you know, go in person and and go support uh, brick and mortar bookstores. But of course, I know not everybody can do that. So hopefully libraries will have them too. And yeah, the audiobook's super good. I really like the narrator. I thought she did an amazing job. My poor narrators always have many languages to contend with. So I made her send me a sample in French because there's a scene in, in Cannes in the south of France. So she she had her homework cut out for her. So however you listen to it or read it or absorb it, I, I appreciate it. And you can find me, everything is my name, the joys of having a unique name. K-A-R-I-N-T-A-N-A-B-E at Instagram mostly. I'm a little defunct on Twitter, but I'm there. I'm terrible at TikTok, but I'm there. So yeah, shout out. I always love to hear from people. I'll include all the links if you want to follow her and purchase the Sunset Crowd. It's available tomorrow, July 4th. So happy July 4th, oh. everybody. I know I'm excited. They offered me July 4th and I was like, who's, who's going to say no to the, to a 4th of July premiere. So it just like the cover of the book is so summertime, like the vibes just give you the ultimate, like Los Angeles summer and then the timing of it being released. It's just perfect. Yeah. I'm St. Martin's press did very well by me. I love the cover. You never know. Covers are revealed to you in a kind of a weird way. You just get an email being like, here's your cover. And then you open it like kind of like it's a dead rat or something like you're like scared to touch it but I was I was delighted with this one that's awesome I do want to ask you do you have any other are you already working on anything else or do you need like a breather and to get through this no, tour for the book I, I am I I can't breathe I honestly like I I always have some sort of book going I'm I'm working on something about female friendship right now I did an, like an Elena Ferrante binge during the pandemic the Italian writer who wrote My Brilliant Friend, and she writes all about like the push and pull of female friendship, how like your friends can make you like the best version of yourself, but also the worst version of yourself in like competition. And that's what I'm really interested in for my next book. So who knows? I could write something like I'll write like sci-fi, but um, my, my guess is this is that's what this next one will be about. Oh, it sounds very interesting. I love the concept. Well, we will finish up with rapid fire questions. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay. What is the last show you've been? Ooh, the last show I binged. Um, oh, a normal people on Hulu. Okay, great choice. Um, what's your favorite ice cream? Oh, oh God, all of them. Uh, that's probably my favorite food, unfortunately. Uh, but, but I like vanilla. I could eat roughly two pounds of vanilla ice cream. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can do so much with it. You can put nuts on it. You can put berries on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. And um, do you have a favorite rom-com? Oh, my favorite rom-com. Um, oh, God. You know 
what my favorite rom-com is old and like wasn't that popular it's only you with marissa tomei and robert downey jr have you ever seen it um, no not at all i've never even heard of that so it definitely added so it, to my list. it didn't get like it didn't get the like you know you've got mail or sleepless in seattle like movement of the that era but i love it they're in italy and marissa tomei is just fabulous so that's my rec Oh my gosh. It's in Italy. I mean, yeah, that one definitely sounds like one to watch. Um, and do you have a favorite coffee drink? Um, I, I mostly just drink black coffee, but you know, there's, there no coffee is bad coffee. I've never met a coffee drink. I, I, I didn't like, honestly. So yeah, I, you know, shove it in ice cream in it and I'm happy too. Oh my goodness. It's like an ice cream float, I guess. Is that a There's thing? like a fancy Italian name, but I, I don't know what it is. So there you go. I know what you're talking about. It's like Affregato or That's something it. like it's that. That's it. It's Affregato. You got fancy. it. That's, you know the fancy Italian name. Yes. I know the name, but I've never had it. But someone had to explain it to me. And I was like, that sounds amazing. Yeah. I think there's some booze in there, to be honest. I think it's like coffee, vanilla ice cream and, and some sort of alcohol. So, you know. Don't just casually order that at like 8 a.m. and <laughs> unless you're having that kind of day. That's true. Yeah, good to know beforehand. Um, and then finally, this one's kind of specific to you um, because you are a big on historical fiction. If you could live in any time era, which one would you? Okay, this is a hard question because look, I I am always going to say the 20s. I, I love the 20s. I just the literature in the 20s is my jam. But having done so much historical fiction research let me tell you if you are a woman or a person of color the answer is always right now <laughs> like you just you don't actually want to live as a woman in the 1920s because you can't really do anything you know we read about like the 10 women who got away but visually the 20s definitely ideally in a perfect world the 20s <laughs> yeah yeah, take away all the bad stuff, leave me all the good stuff, and like, yes, please, like, throw me into the roaring 20s. Oh, yeah, 100 years ago, isn't that wild? It is wild, yeah. It's crazy. Well, thank you so, so much for talking with me today, Karen. I really appreciate it. I cannot wait to read The Sunset Crab. Amazing. Well, I will put it everywhere, and no, thank you so much for your time, and to everyone who reads books, you know, it's, there's a lot of other things you could be doing with your time, but this one's the best one for your brain. So go forth. Thanks so much. I'll be thinking of y'all. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you can be notified of all the new episodes. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you so much for listening to the Love and Lattes podcast. Have a great day.